So we are anticipating our instructor to be ready in just a few moments. Uh, so just be patient and and know, uh, all of know, the source creator is in control, always in control, and it's working through each one of us to bring in uh, what some have called this new world order, I'm, the real new world order, not the one that's been manipulated and controlled uh, by those that have self-serving interests, but know that new world order that will, uh, where we can see these level playing field that Allah has, has uh, made for all of us, uh, true human uh, globally. And uh, I will pass the talking stick very quickly. <laughs> I see like our beloved brother is ready to uh, go ahead and share what he has to share with his team. Peace to you all. Salam alaikum. Yes, sir. Alaikum salam. Thank you. To my host and my friend, not necessarily in that order. He's my friend first and our brilliant host, William Safir, who's doing a lot of work, not only in front of the camera when you see him, but more importantly, behind the scenes where we need him mostly. And uh, we're making steady progress down the tracks of uh, establishing Nunetics Institute as a bona fide uh, place for you to... <sighs> Come in to learn, basically. Just come and learn, but not just to learn the same old, same old. To learn that which was being hidden from people for many years. And when I say many years, I'm talking about not only decades and not only hundreds of years, but much of what we're teaching has been hidden from the world for thousands of years, believe it or not. Believe it or not, it was hidden from view, from the world, from the human intellect for thousands of years now. So we're really playing catch up and Allah has given us a decided advantage in this system that we call the Nunetics system. This particular broadcast is intended to reach all people, not just uh, black folks, not just Muslim folks, human folks. So I don't want to spend too many um, sessions in a row dedicated to local kinds of concerns or regional or national or so-called racial concerns. That's not my major concern. My major concern is helping to provide information that's going to help all people in this world become better humans. And if you look at the state of the world right now, particularly in the Middle East, but also over here in the Middle West, the Midwest, <laughs> you're seeing stuff happen that, man, when I was a child, I would never have dreamt that the world would become as acidic, that's the term I'll use, acidic as it has become, meaning everything you touch singes you. Everything you touch will burn you now. No such thing anymore as a true friend on the most part. Most people in the world now have friends through Facebook artificial friends, what we've been talking about for many decades now in terms of the development of artificial humanity. This has been a part of the scheme of shaitan that has been revealed to us in the Quran that he, he is in the business and he's working very hard every day. And when I say he, I'm not talking about a person named Satan or a person named Shaitan. I'm talking about influences in the world that some very, very low down crafty people know how to manipulate in their favor and against our favor. And what is our favor? Our favor, as we should be understanding it, is the favor of Allah called the Ni'mah. That's what Allah tells us in Surah Al-Fatiha that he has favored us with. That he has favored us with his grace, as they translate it, and Aunta alayhim, the grace that he has put upon them. Ni'ma is from the word or related to the word, and Aunta. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that Ni'ma represents towards the end of today's discourse. Inshallah, I hope to get through all of what I have to present to you, which is why I'm not including the opening uh, 
uh, introductions and, and that kind of thing. We're trying to save as much time as we can. And we're trying to make sure that this environment becomes a totally learning environment, a total learning environment. So it's not a social club. It's not come, you don't come here to make friends. <laughs> Although sometimes I think I should recommend that. I get the distinct feeling that some of you who are living very lonely lives, and that's unfortunate because it's unnecessary. We should actually be trying to get to know each other. And we're going to be having sessions, William, in the near future, beginning in January, where it's going to be more social when we get together. We're going to be breaking into breakout groups, which our new website will allow for, so that we can speak to each other, you know, one-on-one -on -one in some cases, maybe um, just in a group of three or four, instead of the 20 and the 30 and the 40 that you're experiencing weekly, where you really can't get a word in except for a greeting. So we're going to do something about that because we are social beings as Allah has created us. So keep that in mind. It's not going to be a strictly, you know, just a robotic kind of a learning environment that you're being invited into. It's going to be fluid. So give it a moment. Just let all of the pieces fall in their respective places. And you're going to have a wonderful time going into 2024 riding upon the back of this new medics method. Trust me, let me bring my notes up and let's get this linguistic party started. Thank you all for being here in these numbers at the very beginning of the class. That's discipline. I love when you show up on time, even if I'm not on time, but I'm always on time. I'm just behind the scenes listening, doing last minute touch-ups on the notes and so forth. All right, so here we go. Let us begin appropriately with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and that is with Allah's signature, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. And uh, if you're new to this class, I like to translate the phrase Bismillah as with Allah's name. Yes, that's what it means. Ism means name. Be Ism Allah is really what we're saying, uh, you know, in a contracted form. Bismillah. Uh, but your name is also your signature, especially on documents that represent important things to do, banking and uh, legal stuff and, you know, uh, somebody who needs your approval for something before they can move forward with a project or something. Uh, those things require signatures. Your, your mother in school, you know, when she comes to deal with your issues. You know, I'm talking to us when we were little now. When she comes to deal with our issues in grade school and the teacher says, uh, well, he's been good or he's been bad or whatever the case is, they issue you a report card and your mother or your father has to sign it. They have to put their signature on that report card, hand it back to the child and hope that if it's a bad report card, that the card will still get back to the school. You know, if it got to the parent, chances are it'll get back to the school. Some children make sure that the report cards don't get to the parent. <laughs> So it remains signature-less. Well, Allah's entire creation bears his signature. What is that signature? It follows Bismillah. Ar-Rahman, that's a part of Allah's signature. Ar-Rahim, that's a part of Allah's signature. The merciful benefactor, meaning the one who is doling out the benefits for all parties involved. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how not so good you are. You can be the most notorious, the most notorious figure in human history. You know, in religion, we say Pharaoh, you know, that kind of thing. In the world, we say Adolf Hitler, you know, that kind of thing. So it doesn't matter. They still all participated in receiving some of Allah's Rahmah in the form of Ar-Rahman, Ar that attribute. The merciful benefactor, the one who is the supplier of all needs, including the air and the water and all of everything else that we need to survive and be given another chance to be right and righteous. Allah does that for every single being that he has created upon the back of the earth, beings in the sky, beings on other planets. We don't know what's out there. We only know that some things are out there because Allah tells us so in the Quran. So he is the one supplying all of the benefits for things that we're not even aware of. 
There's no way in the world we could be aware of or be able to count the number of blessings that have come our way since we've come into this world and began functioning. No way in the world. We have systems in our body that we don't even know the names of. You know, you have a heart, you know, you have lungs, you know, you have a spleen, you know, you have liver and kidneys. But if I were to ask the average person among us specifically, what do those organs do? functionally. Most people would not be able to answer that. They can answer me in terms of what the form is. They might even be able to draw a, a liver on a piece of paper and color it dark brown. They might be able to draw some red kidneys if they think they're red or whatever, or red heart, or, you know, that kind of thing, or lungs, gray lungs, or whatever color lungs are. Many people can do that if they've seen pictures of these forms, but most people, again, I repeat, will not know how these things actually function. And it's our functionality that represents the highest level of our development as Allah created this development. So Allah does that for us, even though we have no knowledge of what these things do. He still provides us with these things, nostrils to breathe, lungs to be able to regulate that breath, along with every other thing in the body and on the body, all the way down to your pinky toe or whatever you think is the least significant part of you, that if you lost it, it wouldn't be that big a deal. <laughs> All right. So we're thankful to Allah for his rahmah, for his mercy and for his merciful benefits. But he's also our rahim the merciful redeemer. So today we're going to be talking about the subject of the two readings. I did a webinar under that name. You'll probably be able to find that first part on YouTube, but I'm revisiting the idea because there are some additional pieces of information that have become very, very pressing in my mind for me to share with you. And uh, this is going to represent probably, uh, um, not probably, but most assuredly, a, um, a part one of this revisiting just a part one. We don't have enough time to visit the entire spectrum of information that I would like to present to you. But uh, just pay close attention to tonight's discourse. Again, we have reminded you a couple of times to have a notebook handy. There will be certain words that I come across that I'm going to ask you to write down and bring back the meanings of and your thoughts on. So I'm wanting now to steer us, as I mentioned in the email, more towards being an interactive and an active participation kind of class, like you would have in the average college or university where your professor would ask you questions and come around maybe and look at what you've written on your paper and even give you a test or two. So you're going to be getting all of that come se uh, semester number 24, which begins July, oh, July, where am I? I'm thinking about my birthday, I guess. It begins January 1. Semester number 24 begins January 1, and the course will take a decided twist and turn and evolution, actually, from that point on to becoming a class that practically guarantees that each one of you who have registered for this course will be able to walk away at the end of each semester with the information solidly locked within the memory bank. I have a system that I'm going to employ for that. So it's taken 23 semesters to get to this system. <laughs> had to feel out a lot of people, had to ask a lot of questions, had to provide a bunch of information. The volume of information that you've gotten in these few years, for those of you who have been with me that long, you know for yourself that the volume of information in and of itself is spectacular. It's, it's amazing how much information we've actually gone over. And most of you have it in your email. You, you have it. Some of you have been uh, even printing. When I used to provide the notes, you used to print those notes and you, you'd make a little book out of it. And that's great. We're going to be going back to that. I'm going to be providing the notes uh, probably from uh, January on for each class that we do. And uh, much of it will also appear in the form of small books dealing with particular subjects. So you're going to have access to a whole lot of stuff. So all I ask you to pay when it comes to that is attention. Just pay attention because whatever you pay attention to expands. 
This is Sunday, December 10th, 2023. Of course, I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal. And we're going to be talking about the two readings that are represented in the term Ikra, given in the Quran, which are supposedly the first words revealed by Allah to Muhammad the Prophet. And those first five verses of that particular surah, which is numbered 96, goes thus. Ikra bismi rabbi kelledi khalaq. Proclaim or read in the name of thy Lord and cherisher who created. So I'm going to be making some commentary along the way, which is where you're going to need your pens and papers. Because much of the Arabic that has been translated from the Quran into English and other languages is actually incorrect. And I've told you that now for better than a year, that it's not based on the fitrah. What Instructor Bilal is bringing to you is based on Allah's fitrah. That means that it has to have compatibility in nature, natural processes, not in mythology, not in all of these other ologies. It, it has to have um, some type of representation, some time, type of factual existence within nature herself. So that's what we're going to be looking for. That's your clue. So it says, to proclaim or to read. And they're telling us now that the word ikra means to read. They're telling us that it's a verb and it means to read, to perform that action, to put eyeballs to paper or whatever they were using as at the time, papyrus or whatever, you know, um, which even in the time of Muhammad the prophet, they didn't even have papyrus in that part of the world. In China, yes. In Southern Arabia, no, they didn't have papyrus. So what in the world was Muhammad supposed to be reading is the first question. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, as you know, the nunetic system of consonantal connections is probably the most important part of the nunetic method. And that is finding consonants. Don't worry about the vowels for now, the open mouth, the, the sounds, A, E, I, O, U. Don't worry about those. A, E, U, E, A, whatever. Don't worry about the vowels right now. They are important, but they're not important in the initial process of learning nunetics. The initial process involves the understanding that comes from the study of the consonants. Now, I'm going to ask you to write down the word consonant, and I'm going to spell it out for you. C O N. And I want you to put a dash after the N. Then I want you to put the word as sonat, S-O-N-A-N-T. I hope I'm spelling that correctly. <laughs> C-O-N dash S-O-N-A-N-T, consonat. Now, the word con as a prefix in this case, because it can mean other things in other cases, in this case, for this particular word, con means with, W-I-T-H. So put that on your paper also. So whatever sonat turns out to mean, this con is saying that in order to achieve this consonant idea, you have to couple that Khan with whatever sonant means. And sonant is from the word sonar. S-O-N-A-R. We're going to take it nice and easy tonight. Sonar. S-O-N-A-R gives us the word sonat or the uh, syllable. It's not an actual word, but the syllable sonat. So it means with sonat. Or with sonar. Now, what is sonar? Sonar is related to the English word sound. Most of you know how to spell that, but I'll give it to you anyway. S-O-U-N-D. That's for people online and younger people who might not be familiar with the spellings to words. So we're talking now about consonant, meaning with sound. That which 
has sound or that which reveals itself once sound is introduced into the equation. So without the sound, no consonant. You can't hear it. You have to apply sound to it for it to become a true consonant. Now let's explain this so that you understand it like ABC. The first consonant in the English alphabet system is the letter B. But the letter B has a vowel. You can hear it, B. It has the vowel E attached to it. So this consonant has the vowel sound of E attached to it, B. So does C. So does D. So does F, but it has E eh attached as a vowel, E, eh, E. Eh. The letter H has A, the, the vowel A attached to it. I, I know you, you see where I'm going. You can do that for each one of the consonants. All of them, in order for you to express them, in order for you to pronounce them, they had to attach a vowel in order for them to be able to express their sound. So if you divorce it from that vowel, all you have is what Imam Muhammad once called the soul of the letter, the S-O-U-L of the letter, bare bones. And the B would then sound like B. I hope you can hear that. B. That's it. B. You have to add the E for it to be B, E, or B. So without it, it's just K, K. S would just be S. H would just be ch. ch. That's it. CH sound. Ch. That's H. You have to add the A vowel for it to become H. So without the vowel, the consonants become somewhat primitive sounding, like a bunch of cavemen trying to communicate. Uh, b, k, d. <laughs> so, so nobody knows what you're talking about if you don't have the addition of the vowel. And I'm going to teach you a very important letter in social civility that the females among us should enjoy. Consonants in their rare form, in their bare bone form, as k, d, s, and all those things we just mentioned. Ch. Consonants are masculine gender in language. Therefore, you can easily deduce that vowels must be feminine gender in their form, following the feminine principle, whereas the consonants minus the vowel sound are following the masculine principle. So what does this mean? It means that they have to be brought together in order to have production. Just like a male and a female has to be brought together before a baby can be produced. It's the same thing with language. Language operates on the same basic principle of operation that humans operate upon. That's why we call languages family groups of languages the Romance family group of language, the Semitic family group, Afroasiatic family group of languages. You see? So that means that you can do with language and the manipulation of language what you can do with humans and the manipulation of humans. You want humans to be evil? Put them in an evil environment. You want language to be evil? Let people from an evil environment begin deciding what you should do, what you should say, how you should uh, communicate with each other. And it's gotten so bad now in our day and time that you can hardly look at anything on television. I remember at least we used to be able to look at public television, you know, channels two, four, five, seven, uh, nine, and 11, and I think 13 when I was growing up. And man, if you had heard uh, if you had heard the word D A M N, that would have caused a hissy fit.
amongst the social elite, the people in media. They would have, man, you remember George Carlin speaking on the seven words that you're not supposed to pronounce on television. He actually opened the door to all of this cussing and fussing that you see comedians especially doing on television now. And it's to the point where if you don't come out with some level of vulgar information or language, people don't even want to watch you. It's to the point now where if you're making a movie and you don't have a sex scene in it, even though the sex scene is not even appropriate to the storyline, but if you don't have it, the people are not going to come and support it. That's how dumbed down they have made the average person in the American society. That's a story for another night, but keep that in mind as we proceed. We're talking about language. And remember, I told you that the word language is related to the word languid. I'm going to spell languid for you. L-A-N-G-U. I-D. L-A-N-G-U-I-D. And William, if I'm pronouncing anything incorrectly, please correct me. But I believe that's how you spell languid. And there's also the word languish. That's related to the word language. And languish is L-A-N-G-U-I-D. S H once again, L A N G U I S H languish. If you're languishing, it means that you're sitting in a place where you're inoperable, you're 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 inactive, ineffective, and all you're going to do is grow weak. See, you're going to grow languid and die. If you're languishing in prison, you understand now. So this is a possibility within the construction and manipulation of language. It can be purposely designed to make people languid, weak here, mentally, emotionally. And it can also be purposely designed to make people languish, meaning not have any real or determined purpose. And that's the majority of people that we come across on a daily basis. They're just languishing. They're just sitting around waiting for the next day. And if you ask them, say, man, what's happening? What's up? They say nothing. See, that's proof that they're languishing. That's the average answer now. You ask, you ask the people in your family or people on the street or your friends or even in school. Say, what's happening, man? Oh, what's going on, man? Ain't nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> oh, boy. If you were to count the Days of your life by 24-hour days instead of by years. Man, look at how long we've been languishing. Languidly. Mm. And it's no wonder, as William likes to point out now, that the days of the week are called weeks. Week. <laughs> W-E-A-K. And even before they become a week, they become days. <laughs> <laughs> D-A-Z-E. You see, they build all of this manipulation into the language itself. So keep that in mind. So we're going to be looking for the strong points in language, beginning again with this word consonant, which means with sound. Those are two strong words in the English language. With has to do with being supportive. I'm with you, man. Go ahead, do what you need to do. I'm with you. I heard your idea. I'm with that. See, that's support. So when Allah says, with Allah's signature, that means that you're supposed to be there supporting whatever that signature represents. And that signature represents signs in nature. That's what the word signature actually means. Signs, instructions in nature. Not in the scholar, necessarily, not in the parent or the sibling. That's not where the first group of uh, signatures are coming from the source creator. The first group of signatures that Allah signed off on are in nature. What do we mean by nature? What the Quran speaks about when it tells you that there are instructing signs in the skies. as what? There are instructing signs from our source creator that he has placed within the ard or the earth. 
And then Allah says, and in you, us, there are like signs. But Allah says that most people go on heedless, paying it no mind. Where the party at? I don't want to know nothing about no knowledge and no internal stuff going on in me. You don't see my bling? That's enough. I don't need anything inside me. I'm blinging on the outside. That's sufficient for me. Because, again, they have been made languid. And that's why they are languishing in terms of their human potential not being effectuated in this world. They're dying less than the average creature on this earth in terms of their worth. The average creature is doing exactly what Allah created that creature to do. The human being has been given a thinking brain. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So if you're not thinking and making cogent decisions, and those decisions are not actually improving upon the quality as well as the quantity of your life, then you are not truly human. Our guest the other day in the interview, she mentioned the term true. I don't even know if we mentioned it first, William. I think oh, she may have heard it from us. I don't know. Because, you know, that's been a popular saying. Imam Muhammad actually popularized that saying, true humor. But she surely used it to differentiate just the average Joe and Jane human who are doing nothing but languishing in a languid state. So this is a wonderful thing when you understand it. Our super duper senior instructor, <laughs> Hassan Abdullah, who just joined us a moment ago, he loves to end all of his conversations with me and his uh, emails with me and his text messages with me by saying, goodness is on the rise. So don't think that Instructor Bilal is here to give you bad news that you can't use. Instructor Bilal is here to give you good news that you absolutely can use. But we have to know how to differentiate the bad news out so that we're not adversely affected by the bad news. Because all news is frequency. And if you're not aware of how frequencies operate, then those frequencies can easily overtake your frequencies if they provide a stronger vibration than yours. They can actually subdue yours. This is science we're talking now in terms of... Uh, the signatures that Allah has clocked into created things, that all of them have frequency, energy, and vibration. Remember those three words. I'm going to repeat them for you to write down. Frequency, I'm going to spell it out for you. F-R-E-Q-U-E-N-C-Y. One more once. F R E Q U E N C Y frequency. And the key consonants in the word frequency are the letters F, write that down, R Q, that's it. Don't worry about the rest of the word. The key letters are the F, R, and the Q. And we'll compare those up with words from our Quran that carry those same frequencies, carry those same letters. Most of you should know it already. I've gone over it dozens of times, actually. But it's not important right now. So, consonant means with sound. And until the sound appears in the form of a vowel, the feminine principle, then the masculine principle consonant, that dry, dull sound, that primitive sound, can't express itself. Now, why is that socially significant for humans? What it is saying is that as much machismo, as much manliness, as much alpha male as we can, you know, stir up within ourselves and deposit into the world, you know. You're really not making progress until you learn to introduce the feminine principle into, into the equation. 
as much you know bravado and all of that that men may have they're not really going to make human progress until they learn to accept side by side with them their counterpart the one who equalizes their energy the one who can even subdue the energy when that energy becomes too offensive becomes too destructive it's the feminine energy that knows how to go in and 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 bring that in and and civilize it and just take care of that business you know what i'm talking about so what is that saying on the social level to the people of intellect? It is saying that you should respect the feminine principle. Beginning with your mother, as Allah says, have taqwa for the wounds that bore you. Have taqwa for Allah, have regardfulness for Allah. Be cautious of Allah and arham, raham, womb, the arham, plural for womb, the wombs that were responsible for you and I being here. Allah says, have a deep regard for the wombs. And it's not just a physical womb that you came through when you were born out of your mama's belly. You have gone through subsequent wounds since being physically born into this world. Subsequent wounds. You've gone through emotional development. You've gone through rational development where you became a more rational person after being overly emotional as a child. You remember crying over spilled milk, as they say. As you grew older and you learned better and your mother and father and the society and the school teacher and all of those people began teaching you better sense. Well, you grew out of that emotional womb. You're not as emotional as you used to be, hopefully. And you began growing into the womb of reason. See, R-E-A-S-O-N, write that down. I know you already know how to spell it, but I'm doing this for a reason. You grew into the womb of reason. R-E-A-S-O-N. This time I want you to separate it by a dash after R-E-A dash S-O-N. And what is that actually saying to us? The word R-E-A is another way of saying R-A-Y. Rhea, Ra, Ray, all of those are the same word. So when you see them, understand that they're referring to light. Just like a ray of light from the sun. Now, without me telling you what the S-O-N means, although I did in my last statement, if you caught it, and speaking about the S-U-N, it's, that's what S-O-N is referring to. So the word reason is a code word for ray of sun. Oh, wow. How did that hit you? Put it in the chat box. <laughs> the word reason. See, this is how you have to teach your children, you school teachers out there. Especially in the Clara Muhammad school. I don't know what you're waiting on. This is how you have to teach your children. Man, we could speed this thing up so quickly. Because what I just told you is good for kindergarten all the way up to college level. Those of you in the audience right now, you're in your 30s and 40s and 70s, and it hit you that way. And it's going to hit your child that way, except your child is going to grab it and run with it like we won't. <laughs> we won't even tell our wife what we just learned, our husband. Yeah, that's that. we need to. Now, I'm not talking to this group. I know you are very interactive with your spouses. I'm talking to the people in La La Land out there who will be watching this and hopefully appreciating it and taking notes from in front of their computers and televisions and cell phones as they watch this. So reason means ray of sun. What is the sun allowing us to do? Even if it's just a single ray, it's like the ray of a flashlight. That's a ray of light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it allows us to see at least what that particular ray is pointing to. 
So you might not be reasonable in all situations, but if you're able to get some rational grasp of a conversation or a topic or something, and you begin speaking on that topic, you become the boss of that topic. People say, that sounds right. That sounds reasonable. You get it now? Reasonable. So reason means a ray of sun. And we know that S-O-N in the English language represents a product of a mother and father, a balancing act. Even though it's a boy, it's the product of a masculine and feminine principle. See? So that ray of light is also a product of a masculine and feminine principle. That's what reasoning is. It's being balanced. And I think that's enough said on that topic. A word that is normally exchanged with reason is the word rational. You need to be more rational. Where does that word come from, ration? We know that in the armed services, such as the army, they have what they call rations that they give out to the soldiers in the form of food. Maybe some other things that are non-food items, but mostly when they speak about rations, they're talking about a little thing in a pack and something to suck on as liquid and all that. And going out into the field now, you got enough. <laughs> you might not have a full belly, but you got enough. You got your rations so that when the hunger hits you, you're able to at least stave it off, you know, until you can get back and have a full meal. So that's what rationalization is. That's what being rational is. That's what rationing is. What you're rationing is information. You're actually nibbling, if you will, on information. You're not trying to take the whole thing in, just like right now. You can't take in everything that I have to bring to you tonight. You're nibbling when you just write down, scratching down some words and what I'm saying and what it means. And then you have to go back and study if you want the full meal. See, the rations that I'm giving you is just designed to take you from point A to point B until, like I said, you can sit down at the full meal, which you will plan and design and 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 you you'll be doing that based on your notes and the ideas that Allah blesses you with. And then you can come back and share that meal with the rest of us. This is how it works. So why ration? Because the word ration is related to the rodent called the rat. Listen carefully. It's related to the rodent, the R-O-D-E-N-T, called the R-A-T, rat. I'm about to bring this thing home. We're talking about Ikra. We're talking about what this particular surah means. For real, for real. So what does the rat do? The rat will be out scouring and looking and ducking in holes and hiding underneath stuff. And he doesn't like to be brought out into the pure light. He likes to operate in the shadows. He likes to operate when the lights go out. And when the light comes on and you begin coming in his direction, he likes to scurry off. Because he believes that you're going to be a threat to what it is he's looking to ingest as food for his survival or her survival. So they don't like you because they think you are a threat to their livelihood. Nothing personal. They just think you're a threat to their livelihood. And do you know that that's how people are who ingest pieces of information from media, social media, regular media, or their friends and gossip and backbiting and all of that. All of that represents us nibbling off of that information. You know, the rat doesn't care whether it's quality food or not. Doesn't have to be a slice of newly purchased cheese. <laughs> Rat will be all up in the garbage can. You know? And it's a sign, an ayat, that Allah says he placed all around us and in us, but we're not paying attention. It's a sign that many of us, unfortunately, act and react in the very same way that the rat does. The rat, if he's sitting on his hind legs, I've showed you this in other webinars. If he's sitting on his hind legs with his tail out, and he's got a piece of food 
in his two paws, his two front paws, and with his two buck teeth, he begins nibbling on that cheese or on that apple or whatever he's got in his paws. That symmetry resembles the profile of the human brain and the brain stem that shoots out from the bottom of the brain. It, it resembles it, not exactly, but enough for you to say, hey, he looks like a profile brain. And what is the brain doing? It's nibbling on information. All of the time that its conscious mind is awake, it's nibbling on the pieces of information. And what is it doing it with? It's doing it with its two front teeth. What would those two front teeth then represent? The frontal lobes of the brain, what we call the neocortex and its frontal lobes that are responsible for conscious attention to whatever the five senses bring into its screen. Isn't this wonderful? I'm telling you. The frontal lobes. Now, and there's much more science in that. For those of you who are curious like that, after what I have to say to you today about the human brain, you should be going to town on this subject, even if you've never gotten a degree or maybe even have never had an interest <laughs> in this subject. When I was in high school, I was not interested in science. They couldn't do anything to, to get me to really have an interest in the least in most of the sciences or math. It was only after I started studying independent of the school system that my curiosities became piqued. And most of what I went after as information was just a self-taught experiential, experiential journey for me. Not because my high school teacher said, you should study this. No. So that's the rat. So there are different, uh, different uh, creatures, different animals that ingest food in different ways. You need to study the differences between how the dog eats his food how the rat that we were just discussing eats, I said disgusting, I, I meant disgusting, but it turns out to be the same thing based on some of the stuff that the rat likes to eat. So don't let your mind become like the rat. It can become rational, but don't let the mind be of such a nature that it stops with small nibbles when it's investigating topics and subjects for learning. Don't let it stop at the nibble aspects of its inquiry or its curiosities. Dig deep into these subjects. If you find yourself interested, let's move on. We're talking about it, which they translate as read. And you know that the letters D and T are interchangeable. So you should also know that there's going to be some similarities between the word read in English and the word we were just discussing, rat. Yeah. We're reading to become more rational. But there's another component that is supposed to be side by side with the development of the rational mind that is supposed to provide its equilibrium. So you have the rational aspects of your mind's development, but it's supposed to be coupled with a moral inclination in you. And it's the moral inclination that is going to intercept information that is leading you off of the road to progress. It's going to intercept that information. When you say, I need money, and the rational mind says, hey, man, I know how you can get some money. Let's go talk to Uncle Fuki. You know, he used to be in that business. I think he'll give us a one more once just because he loves his nephews. And you go talking to Uncle Pookie, and Uncle Pookie says, well, I need some, you know, I need some, ca some cash too, man. So there's a very easy bank that we can go just hit real quick. You know, the police ain't doing a whole lot these days. <laughs> you know, 
I think we can pull off this, you know, we put that mask on that they've been trying to get us to wear anyway. And let's just go in there, man. I got a piece. You know, I, I'll find a piece for you and I'll find a piece for your homie. And let's just go do this, man, because all of us need money. We got to survive. That's what I heard a young African-American woman saying. She couldn't have been out of her 20s for sure. Maybe mid, not even mid to I think this little girl was about 21, maybe. And she had her mask on and she was trying to justify all of the looting and the stealing that the smashing grab folks are doing in this day and time. And she said, I don't care. I don't feel no way about it. I'm Look, they have insurance. This is what she said. They have insurance. And, you know, in a lot of these major cities now, they they're told not to stop you if they are security. They, the security are told don't stop them. If you stop them, you're going to get in trouble. So you see television footage galore about especially young people who are running and most of them look like us right now running into these stores busting the glass or having it opened by security personnel or the store management or whatever. they just let them in because they're just going to write it off that's what the young people are saying and there's no skin off their backs they're just going to write this stuff off and get them some more but no that's not how it happens what you do is you're running out legitimate businesses from your community you're running out people who are contributing to the tax base in your community, and you're leaving your community high and dry. Not only that, but you may have some gung-ho police person who don't give a damn, excuse the expression, about whether he knocked you in the head with his club while you're trying to rob. If he shows up on the set and you try to run from him, you got some police that use that as the excuse of the year. And they are racist, many of them. And they'll have a stick that they have nicknamed a nigger knocker. This is my nigger. They don't tell you that in the public. <laughs> but this is my nigger knocker. I'll knock a nigger out quick with this club. And they'll say it was a part of their job. I was stopping a heist. I was stopping a theft. And they resisted. See, So that young girl, she's taking a chance like that. I don't know if she's a mother yet. But she may very well never be one with that attitude. She may be sitting in somebody's prison or she may end up in somebody's graveyard, unfortunately and unnecessarily. So what do these words that begin with R and end with D, what do they have in common? What do they mean? We're going to get to that a little bit later in the notes. I just wanted to get you intellectually excited about tonight's lesson. So they translate this as read in the name of your Lord and cherisher who created the word halakha is past tense for create. It means he created a thing. Halakha, halak, halakha. It means a bit more than that, which we'll investigate in a moment. For time's sake, we're going to push forward. Remember also <clears throat> that the Arabic word Rab, that they're translating as Lord, actually is speaking to an evolutionary process that Allah has clocked into created things, especially biologic things, living things, organisms and systems. They are experiencing an evolutionary growth based on a programming that Allah has clocked into the very genetic fabric of that creature. So whatever we're talking about that's a living organism is experiencing evolutionary growth and development is the point. That's what Rab is referring to. Much more than that. But for our purposes, just understand that it's representing an evolutionary programming. So you can take the word halak and instead of just saying he created, you can actually substitute the word created with the word programmed. Programmed. Pro means to push something forward, to be for something. All right? And I'm going to let you investigate the several meanings in the dictionary for the word gram. That's part of your homework. G-R-A-M 
what does it mean? And look in different places. Look in the online etymology dictionary. Look in Webster's. Look in uh, American Heritage Dictionary. Uh, just Google it online and see what the computer tells you. What does gram mean? We know that it has significance in the world of drug dealing also. So many grams of cocaine. It has significance also in uh, other areas, especially food. Where your food, even your liquids are given to you in grams on the side of the soda bottle so that you can't figure out what they're talking about. You don't know how much that is. If they said ounces and pounds, you might be able to figure it out. But when they start breaking down the nitty gritty of what that food is comprised of, they say so many grams of salt, so many grams of sugar. And you don't know how to convert 40 grams of sugar into teaspoons. Some of those sodas are carrying as much as 20 and 30 spoons of sugar in a 16 ounce serving. Would you ever, ever, ever on your own with your conscious brain sit at a table and take 30 straight spoons of white sugar and just shove it down your throat? You'd never do that, I hope. But that's what you're doing every time you drink a 7-Up, a Coca-Cola, a ginger ale. Story for another night. Karima will be on that. And now. So the word program is to be substituted for the word create. Chalak, he created. No, he programmed. So we have read. This is beautiful. People still coming into the classroom. We have read in the name of thy Lord and cherisher who programmed a thing. Oh, my goodness. Let's go forward and see what Allah is programming. And I want you to think about this programming on the same level as the computer programmer, because that's all we are. The most sophisticated computer ever introduced into this world. The human. Not the IBM, not the Apple, the human. Not by Bill Gates by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the source creator of all, whatever name you're calling, that source is fine. But that one is the master programmer. And he didn't just program you, the human, he programmed the bug that I just dealt with a little while ago in this room. He programmed that too. Programmed every living being and inanimate being. He programmed the sun to do what it does, the moon to wax and wane, the air to flow into the four basic directions. That's programming and it's consistent programming. And Allah said that his sunnah never changes his way, his, his path, his way of uh, uh, doing things based on this most sophisticated programming. He said it never changes. He doesn't violate his own creation. The integrity of that creation is what we're talking about. So we are the most sophisticated computers ever built, ever created. But don't call yourself a computer. Call yourself a human being. Computer is a very nasty word. If you speak Espanol and anyone has ever called you a puta, a P-U-T-A, you know how bad that word is. Don't do that to yourself. Don't ever call yourself a computer. And see, they call the computer a computer because of the amount of stuff that gets put into it. Like a puta. Like in the street, we say like a hoe. Yeah, see, you don't know how many different men are in her. You don't know how many different ideas and minds went into that computer. You go one place, it takes you to a college course. You go to another place, it takes you to pornography. So how many different sperms have been poured into this puta? I got to make it clear for you. So, no, don't call yourself that. And you already know what come means. Come, P 
pewter. I didn't give you the whole picture right there. And you can figure out the rest for yourself. So uh, I add two of Surah 96. We're dealing with just the five first verses or the first five verses of Ikram that they translate as read. Now, I want you to be aware of something that Allah does to draw your attention to the most important words that he's revealing at the time. He repeats words. Grammatically speaking, there was really no reason for him to repeat the word khalaq. See, he, he put it here, khalaqa. So why does he begin the next sentence with the same word, khalaqa? He took a breath here, so to speak. Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min Now he's bringing your attention to what he programmed. This is so beautiful when you understand it. He's bringing your direct attention to something that he wants to expand within you. Everything that you give your attention to expands. That's a law in the fitra. That's Allah's sunnah. Created man, al-insan, created man out of a mere clot of congealed blood. Not a good translation, but one that we can work with. So he created whoever an insana is, and that's where he wants to draw your curiosities. We know he did all of this that's in us and around us, but what is this thing that we call us? What are the properties of this that Allah is telling us he programmed? See, most people sit down at their computers on a day-to-day -day basis, at their job, at the workplace, in the home, on their uh, cell phone, and they, you know, they're texting back and forth. But they don't know how well, many of that, really. They don't know how it really works. They don't know the programming. There are just a few people, relatively speaking, who are knowledgeable in terms of computer programming. In other words, when the computer has a mishap, when the computer goes haywire, these are the people that they call up and say, come fix my computer, man. I'm losing too much money. So you could be owning a computer. Doesn't mean you know how to run one and fix one and program one. It's the program of making the big bucks. And it's the people in the world who have programmed human behavior who are making the big bucks as we speak. Major corporations, major people who are controlling the very ideas that we are situated upon academically, emotionally, intellectually, and even instinctively. We have situated our very human lives upon the foundation of lies that have been perpetuated by people who are sitting behind the curtains who you never meet, you never learn their names even, most of them. I'm, I'm not talking about the Bill Gates and the George Soros people. I'm talking about the people behind the fence who actually control them. They are programmed by another set of people that sit behind the curtain like the Wizard of Oz and you're not supposed to see them. So you blame the Israelis, you blame the Muslims, you blame the Christian uh, mushrik, <laughs> the idol worshippers, thinking that they are the frontline <laughs> enemy. When in fact, those people, if they have gone off of the fitrah path, it is because they are being programmed by a superpower that is sitting behind the fences that we never voted for. These are people who are self-elected. Like Iblis, he elected himself to be the boss. And he was willing to pay the cost to be the boss. Allah chose Adam. Iblis said, I'm going to elect myself for this position. I don't want to be the vice president under Adam. I want to be the de facto leader and ruler of everything that I put my hands on. So later on in the evolution of this demonic mentality, that Iblis becomes Fir'aun. 
Pharaoh. It's the same character. It's just stretched out of proportion. Now he's a he's just gone wacko. Same arrogance, though. That's the underlying theme between Iblis and Shape and uh, 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 um, uh, between Iblis and uh, uh, Piraun. That's the underlying theme. Arrogance. Arrogance. Listen to the word. Another one I want you to write down. I'm about to spell it. A R R O G A N C E. Arrogance. Let's break it down. You know what an arrow is, as in bow and arrow, as in what the Quran calls the rifling of arrows back in the time of Muhammad the prophet, which was a sin. Won't get into all of that. It's not necessary right now. But you know what an arrow is. An arrow is to be aimed, especially if your target is way off in the distance. The arrow is to be aimed upwards. If the target is right in front of you, Okay, you can you, you can get a straight shot. If your target is way down there and there's a bunch of people coming towards you, you're going to see those soldiers take their bows and arrows and aim them towards almost the sky because they know that the arrow is going to go up, up, up and away. And then when it comes down, it's going to hit somebody. If there's a crowd of people there, it's going to hit somebody. If you're aiming for a direct single target, that's different horizontal shot. If you're aiming at a group of people that you want that arrow to go way up and then come down with some force into the top of someone's head or neck or torso, then you aim up. So the arrow represents that which goes up. Now, what's going up in arrogance? The estimation that people have about who they are, just like Iblis, he had a wrong estimation about his worth. He said, you created me, Minar, from fire. Doesn't fire like to go up, up, up? So it was the estimation. And he said, you created me from fire. So he was giving you what he thought was insight into his physical makeup, his, his biology. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm better than him because of my genes. So now you got the clue to the second syllable, gents. Arrow, gents. It means high gene. <laughs> this is beautiful when you understand it. The word arrogant is related to the word hygiene. These are cold words in the English language. He thought he was the highest of the jinns. He, he was hygiene and he was hygiene. Now, when somebody thinks their hygiene is better than yours, you know how they're going to treat you when they get around you. Get away from these stinky people, these poor, these this trash. <laughs> oh, buddy, man, oh, man. This is beautiful when you understand it. So that sums up Iblis' his whole persona. He believed that he was of superior stock. Now, you can take that tagline right there and apply it across the board to all of these people, these organizations, these uh, sororities, whoever you can point at who thinks that they are better than other people. Ku Klux Klan, uh, the Nation of Islam was even suffering from that because of the misunderstanding of the teachings that they were receiving about the black man and the white man and all of the rest of that. And they thought that they were of a higher and more superior genetic stock. It's called arrogance, arrogance, being arrogant. There's a lot to say about that arrow that we don't have time to cover tonight. That's why I need for you to write these words down and investigate independent of this class. So look at what's being said. How was this programming to take place? I pray that everyone out in listener land is okay. We're taking our time tonight. So what was being programmed? 
the one called Al Insan, this one right here, Al Insan, min alak. That's what he was programmed from. See? Al Insan, Khalaka, program, he programmed Al Insan from min in alak. So that's going to be a very important note for you to put into your notes what this term alak means. They translate it as congealed blood, a clot, a coagulation, a bonding process taking place in the blood. That's what al insan. So Allah is giving you, this is no rocket science. The Quran is not rocket science. The Quran is a book that will reveal its splendor to you reveal its most uh, hidden treasures because they're actually not even hidden. They're only hidden because you're not willing to put in the work. The Quran is presenting wisdom within the context of a word environment. Just like you can't know what a neighborhood is like by looking at one house on one block. You can't even know what a true neighborhood is by looking at a row of houses in a particular neighborhood. You got to do that and then go to the other side of town and look, over, see what kind of supermarkets right are there. A lot of times you can tell the neighborhood just by what supermarkets are there. You see Costco's, you see Ikea, you know, you see these things. You're OK, this is a this is a to do. This is a well to do neighborhood here. But if you only see Food Lion and Piggly Wiggly. That neighborhood has some work to do, see? So people judge neighborhoods based on the environment. And it's the same thing with understanding the Quran. You have to judge it within the context of its word environment. There are keys and clues within the other words that Allah allowed to surround a particular important word like al-insan. What is it about al-insan? We know that he's been created or programmed by Allah. And now we know what he was programmed from. We knew the we know the raw material that Allah used to create the one called Al Insan. And that's what's going to give us the deep, 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 deeper insight into what Al Insan means, so that you'll stop saying Al Insan is people, the humans that Allah created. It's humanity, just human beings. But you can't even tell me what the English word human means. That's how dumbed down we have become. No offense. Take no offense. I, I, I beat people over the head a little bit to wake them up to their deficiencies that are not their fault. It's only your fault after you're given better sense and you don't continue to investigate. All right? So, خَلَقَ insana min alaq. Listen carefully. I'm going word for word. And I pray that you don't have that short attention span that most people in America are suffering from right now. Give it to me in two minutes or I don't want to hear it. Well, then you're not. Uh, <laughs> this ain't for you, partner. This is not for you short attention span people. We'll catch up with you later when you when you are suffering enough to understand that you need this for your own sanity, sanity, insane, you get it? I'm showing you the continental connections between Arabia in the Quran and English based on the people in history who took from the Quran to develop their language and their linguistic skills. Sanity is related to insane. Sanitation is related to insane. The inclination to keep yourself clean and pure is what sanitation is, cleaning up the garbage out of the neighborhood. That's a part of what Ellen San is. Keeping yourself sane, not insane. It's not insane. It's an insana, san, like sun, sun. See, the bright light that we were talking about earlier. The rays, the reason, the rays that you're supposed to be using to find your way down the road. Road, another word that is speaking the same language as the word read. Because reading is a road. And all roads have a conclusion. 
and so do all things that you read, hint, hint. You don't pick up a book to read forever. You pick up a book hoping to get to the end of it so you can say, wow, what a wonderful journey. Just like if you're on a road, you're not on the road to stay on the road forever. You're on the road to pass by all of the beautiful spots and the tourist attractions and all, but you're heading to a destination. You're not just wasting gas going nowhere and going round and round in circles. You're hoping to get to a final destination. Just like when you read a book, you're hoping to get to the end, the final destination. So Ikra, if it does mean read, it means that Allah has put you on a journey. He's put you on a reading road that he intends for you to get to the end of. And we'll discuss what that end is in just a moment. So created the human being out of a clot of congealed blood. Now, I have been telling you for years now, if you've been with me that long, what blood means as a symbol. Blood is indicative of the human being's social nature. Social nature. Put that down. Blood equals social nature. And social simply means that Allah has programmed us with a nature that wants to gather together. It wants to come together. It wants to coagulate, if you will. Even strangers, hey man, haven't seen you in this supermarket. I've been seeing you now for the past two or three days. Are you new in the neighborhood? Yeah, where are you living? I'm right here. Oh, I'm right there. I'm practically your neighbor. And then you start to speak to each other every day and you get to know each other and your wives might become best friends after a time hmm? because you're being social. I've also told you that the word social is a code word for the soul shell, the soul's shell meaning the soul's protection, what protects the human soul. These wisdom points are built into the English language because the people who established this language and perpetuated this language and preserved this language against odds, against the high up people who wanted to squatch out these meanings. So they had to go underground and hide these precious meanings within the context of the words construction. Not that they were trying to hide anything from you. They didn't even know you. They knew the king and the servants. <laughs> and most of the servants were as dumb as a box of rocks. So they couldn't share it directly. The servants would see it as being stupidity. So shell, so doesn't have a shell. The turtle has a shell. What is this dude talking about? That's how common people think or don't think. So they preserved it within the context of coded language, hoping that sometime in the future, as society became more and more evolved intellectually, academically, and even emotionally, that there would be people peppered throughout the communities, throughout the society, throughout the country, in the countryside, and one of them would wake up to the wisdom. They had hope and faith that that would happen. Just like in our particular situation, W.D. Farad, who taught Elijah Muhammad, he was hoping and praying that that Wallace baby, that Wallace D, that he named Wallace D, would one day, if he peppered his environment with the right academic stimuli, the right words and the lessons and the right things for his daddy and mommy to tell him that Mr. Farad told them to tell him. He was hoping that that intellect would one day become activated. And it did. But not because of Mr. W.D. Farad, because of Allah's superseding and overriding Mr. Farad's plan, a subject for another night. So, created the human being called insan. Now, what does this word insan mean? If you look it up in the Lane's lexicon, Arabic English dictionary. It, it, there's a strange entry there, strange to me. It says to become familiar. 
So this word insan has to do with becoming familiar with other people who you didn't previously know. Like the neighbor I just told you about who met another neighbor who he didn't even know was his neighbor in the local super supermarket and got to know him. That's being familiar, learning to become familiar. And of course, the word family comes from familiar because family is supposed to be the one group, the one social group that as a default is familiar with the other members. See, you can't say that about the neighborhood. You don't become familiar with them just because uh, they're in the neighborhood. You become familiar with your family because you're born into them. When you become conscious as a child and have parents and siblings, that's all you knew. You didn't have to be introduced to them. Nobody had to say, this is your brother. You just knew that growing up in the house, right? So that's what we're talking about. And in sign has to do with becoming familiar with each other. And we call being familiar with each other or becoming familiar, we call that becoming sociable with each other. See how the word social is built into there? So why does the soul enter into this equation? Because the more and more you attach yourself to other people who you didn't previously know, you are contributing to the development and the further evolution of the human soul itself. Your soul was created by Allah to expand based on what? The attention that you give to it and the attention that your family gives to your development and then the attention that the society gives to you being a member of the community that they are now contributing to. Oh, that's little Ben. You know, he's a smart little guy. He's in second grade now. And look at how look at the grades he's bringing back from little grade school. And you encourage him. The neighbors encourage him. Well, all of that encouragement is socialization that's feeding the growth of his human soul to become more and more sensitive to the people who are becoming more and more sensitive to him or her. Make sense? Nod your heads at home. <laughs> I know it makes sense. Yeah, all right, William, thank you. <laughs> Great information tonight, and I hope you appreciate my teaching style. It morphs every now and then. So, created Al Insan, programmed Al Insan, the being that Allah created to become familiar with other beings, beginning with the family life. See, see how this goes. That need or desire in the human being to become familiar begins in the household. Now, if they cut you off from your familial ties, <laughs> they are interfering with the groundwork that Allah is doing on the development of your soul. They make you disrespect your family, care less about your parents, but you want to hang out with homeboy and go to the park and shoot off the pistol and drink the wine and smoke the blunt behind somebody who you just met two weeks ago. You don't even know where his lips been, but you're taking a blunt that he just had on his lips and you're putting it on your lips. And before you, and I know people who this has happened to, before you know it, they're in critical condition in the hospital or they're lacing this stuff with a pro or whatever that is. Uh, whatever that drug is over there coming out of Mexico and other places, they're just lacing stuff. They just, they just laugh themselves in, in, until they go to sleep be, uh, uh, from the deaths that they're causing because they're spiking a drink or lacing a cigarette. And these are the people that we gravitate towards for social acceptance. Forget about the family. Forget about the near neighbor we have to we have to bring this thing back home because home is where the hum is home is where the homo sapien is supposed to be the hum is the frequency and the frequency begins its regulation based on the disciplines and the responsibilities that are placed upon the frequencies 
first and foremost in the home. Now, when you start humming together in the home, we call that a harmonizing or harmonizing. It becomes harmonious. Every now and then, somebody will come in with a discordant tone. And it's up to us to make the adjustment in the home, whether it's punishment or additional help with the homework or whatever, so that that discordant note that our ears hate to hear when you hear that the strumming of the guitar and everything is mellow and harmonious, and then somebody will twang, you know, whoa. <laughs> Home is supposed to fine tune that discordant note or that untuned string in the house. Many of us now are having families that are full of discordant notes and, and messed up strings and piano keys. And we just banging away, da, 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 you know, banging away, causing so much confusion for society. People pulling pranks that lead to the murder of their friends and other people and other strangers. Why? Because they're not being finely tuned at home. The people who are responsible for tuning them up are not tuned themselves. So now they need an extraneous force. I hope you're seeing your role in the future. Because that's what this world is coming to. It's coming to the point where the social psychologist is going to be one of the most important roles that you can take on in the not too distant future. I believe that the highest paid jobs are going to go to those who have a proven track record for correcting this psychological malady that many people are going through. Now, almost every other person is going through this now. They can't regulate their frequencies. They can't bring themselves back into harmony with the rest of the creation. They can't reconcile with their brothers and sisters in the household. They're fighting with their neighbors. They're going into the grade schools and the high schools and they're just letting off, just firing, killing 30, 40 children at a time. You hear it on the news, this is not new. But what in the world is getting into the minds of these people, particularly the younger set of people, they're being programmed, their halak is being upset. The DNA programming, the emotional programming, the intellectual programming, doesn't mean that they're dumb. Many of these children are smart. Many of these adults are brilliant. Some of them geniuses, but again, if you're using your rational faculties without regard for the moral complement that is supposed to accompany the rational figuring out of how to do things and do them quick for your benefit, then you're going to have a problem. It's like a person walking on one leg when they were created to walk on two. Allah mentions that in the Quran. He says, are they even? Are they the same? The man walking on one leg, hopping along, hop along, Cassidy, on one leg. And the man walking evenly on two. Allah asks this question in the Quran. Are they the same? Are they, are they equal? Allah asks. And he doesn't answer it because he knows your rational moral brain can answer that for yourself. Just, just picture it. The man walking, hopping along on a, on a crutch or something or, you know, whatever. One leg. And the man coming behind him walking evenly in his gait, in her gait. The person walking evenly in a balanced manner. Are the two equal? Heck no. All right, so created al insana, then you have the word. Oh, one other important point about al insan, insan, insan. Insan, al insan, represents the human being who 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 are are categorized as two things. I already told you about the familial aspect, the family, the becoming familiar aspect of al insan. So that's one thing, and it's represented in the term social. Al insan represents the social man. So put that on your paper. Al insan, I'm going to spell it for you. A L dash I N S A A N. One more once. A L dash I N S A A, for pronunciation's sake. 
N, excuse me, to be pronounced El Insan. Don't say El Insan. Say El Insan. Because that vowel elongation is a part of what's necessary down the road for you to get better understanding of what Allah is saying. Nothing in the Quran is happenstance. Everything is purposeful on the part of the source creator placing it there and having you pronounce it like that. Now, El Insan, the social being. When we say man, you know we mean male and female. But just for the sake of people who haven't caught up with that, the being, the social being. El Insan represents the socially oriented being, the one who wants to become more and more familiar with other people in a social environment, beginning at home. Now, the second thing that Al Insan means, and what I'm giving you now is meanings for Al Insan, is straight from the pages of Imam Muhammad's language and logic. So be aware of that. I have to give credit where credit is due. The second thing that Al Insan represents is the thinking being. The social being, see, these are the two legs. The social being who makes progress forward, just like your legs make progress forward. And the thinking being that makes progress forward because he and she are thinking people. They avoid a whole lot of mishaps and mess ups because they are thinking along the road <laughs> as they continue to read their environment. See? There are many rats on that road, so you got to be careful. When there's danger on both sides of the street, sometimes the best thing to do is to walk in the middle. <laughs> you don't know where the danger is going to come from. So you walk as sirat al-mustaqim, the middle path, down the straight path. Now, the social being and the thinking being. And let me show you what order they're to go in. They're to go in the order of the development of your social senses. First, your social inclinations, social application of behaviors and thoughts that are intended to assist you in navigating the social environment. Now, as you navigate the social environment as a social person, you're going to run into those people, like I mentioned again, in the supermarket or wherever it happens to be. You run into strangers and you get to know those strangers to become familiar with these strangers. Now, immediately what kicks in is a need for the brain to become activated on the level of serious thinking capacity. See, when you are at home with just your small group of people and the children are being born into that circle, there is not a whole lot of challenge for the intellect in that environment. A dumb father could be king of the hill in a house like that, but he can't be king of the hill on his job site if he remains dumb like that. There's more of a challenge to his intellect out here, outside of the home, than there will ever be at home. The woman, just she just loves him because, you know, I love you just the way you are. You know, those dumb songs. <laughs> Excuse me. It sounds pretty. Barry White and Joe, Joe, whatever his name was, that sang that song. Sounds pretty. What is a reality that you love someone just the way they are? Really? I'm a mass murderer. I'm a child molester. I'm, I'm with you now. You love me just the way I am? Oh, hell no. Anyway, another story for another night. Now, thinking is activated based on your engagement and interaction with other people outside of the people you are already familiar with. When you got to go outside of the home and work, you have to learn that job. That takes thinking. When you have to calculate your money at 
pay time, payday, and decide how much money is going to go towards the food, how much is going towards the rent, how much is going towards a new vehicle that you need to get back and forth to. When you start to go out and interchange and engage with other people in society, then the thinking capacity becomes turned on, see? And because you're thinking about it, you're paying it attention. And because you're paying it attention, it's going to get bigger, that thing you're paying attention to. So society becomes bigger, becomes larger for you. Now your weekends are spent taking a movie in with your wife and family. Now your weekends are spent going to Golden Corral for family dinner. Now your days of the week are spent, uh, you know, uh, your construction workers sitting up on a beam, you know, hundreds of feet up in the air, eating your lunch with your fellow construction workers. You're socializing. But all of that socialization demands that the intellect be a more thinking kind of intellect that is paying more attention than you would ever pay in your little family circle with your children rustling up your hair, you know, dad just, really, you know what I'm saying, with your children taking their mother's little lipstick and the little girl, little three-year-old, see you rubbing it on her lips and all across her face and, and you laughing, oh, look at little Susie. <laughs> That's funny in the household, but that ain't funny if you saw somebody doing that at your job or in the school. Things that were funny and that you could get away with, <laughs> that were comedy almost. At home, little jokes you tell and talking about other family members. Well, you're so fat. You know those little fat jokes and all that. You do all that, you get away with that at home. Although a lot of it is cruel. But you get away with it at home. But you can't get away with that. When you go to school and you tell your teacher, you're so fat, and you tell her the fat joke about herself, you'll be kicked out of school. Because your social sense has to become broader the more and more people you become familiar with. So that al insan is the being that first learns to become familiar with people in a social context. And it's the social context that flips on the switch to better thinking, more creative thoughts and thinking and rationalizing and reasoning and figuring things out and accommodating other people, making concessions with other people. You don't have to do that at home necessarily. You're the king of the hill in your house. You're the queen of the hill in your house. Just ain't going to tell you what to do. <laughs> I hope <laughs> some do, but most of them. They learn better that better than that. They learn out of that quick. They did in my house when I was going to my we couldn't tell my mother to do something like we're being the demanding one and you better do it because we said do oh heck no. That ain't how things went in my house. And I know most of you out there are shaking it. You write about that instructor. I'll be damned if I, excuse me, instructor. I'll be damned if my children would tell start telling me, don't ask me, don't no permission. They just telling me what they're going. I'm going out. Oh, how old are you now? Twelve. You got your own key now. Well, you ready to check this out. You can go out. I'm going to lock the door and you won't get it back in until you learn how to talk to people. See, it's the kind of families most of us come from. Good families like that. Intelligent families like that. But you can get away with those things when it's just a small brood of you at home. See, brood. Substitute the R for the L. You know, R and L are interchangeable. So brood becomes blood. And we call our family blood. Yeah, what's up? That's my blood. Don't mess with my blood. That's my cuz. We relate. Yeah, we relate it. That's my cuz. Don't bother him. Go bother somebody else. Don't bother him. That's my brother. That's my little brother you, you messing with in the schoolyard. Don't do that. See? So brood, blood. They're related words. Let's keep going. Programmed the social slash thinking being. Al Insan, the social slash thinking being. Keep that in mind. Now, look at the letters in the word Insan, discounting the vowels. So we're dealing with the consonants Nun, and seen, and then a later noon added towards the end. 
But the root of this word, insana, insan, actually grows out of the word ins and nas. So next to the word an insan, I want you to underline the letters N, I, N, and insan, underline N, and then underline the letter S after that, and leave the last noon for further discussion. Insan is related, I repeat, to another Quranic word and that's discussing people. It means people. Nas and Nas, El Nas, but the word is Nas, N A A S, Nas. And there's another word that carries these two important consonants, noon and seen, or N and S, and that word is ins. I-N-S, it's in the Quran. Now, let me explain to you what the importance of these words are in terms of their nunetics value, using the nunetics method of identifying meanings for letters, not just words, but for letters in these fitrah-based Arabic terms that Allah himself has chosen for his Quran. So, there's the word ins, and underline the N and the S, the noon and the seen, in the word ins. I wish I had some Jeopardy music for this. <laughs> Hopefully on the next platform, I'm going to have all of that built into the system. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Or one of our musicians can do something creative as waiting music. So, it's I-N-S. Nas, N-A-S. You can double the A if you want. And insan, oh, I just got a tingle through my nervous system for what I'm about to say to you. Insan, I-N, underline that in, S-A-A-N. Don't underline that last N yet. I-N, underline that in, S, underline that S, A-A-N. Put a question mark next to the last N. So, ints, say it after me at home, ints, nas, insan. Okay, stop there. Now, here's how I want you to begin to hear words from the Quran. Because every method and mode of pronunciation has a significant meaning behind it. This is not William Shakespeare. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, highly glorified is the source creator above all people, things, objects, ideas. Allah is high above them all. Now, noon, it means seed, generally speaking. As a part of your biology, it's represented through your breathing. It also means breath. And that breath is connected to the nose, the nasal, the nose, because it's through the nose that we breathe in and out, in and out. And just like the breathing in and out, I want you to do that breathing on the other side of the computer. Well, that'll put you into a deep meditation if I get you to do that 10 and 20 times in a row. Yeah, it'll put you into a meditative pause. You might fall asleep. <laughs> now, that breathing is connected to something that has a direct relationship with intuition. How intuition operates in the human psyche. Intuition is not something that you go to learn in a classroom. 
Intuition is not necessarily something that you sit in front of your mommy and daddy and they teach it to you. You can't be taught intuition. Intuition is actually something that is working within the fabric of your very DNA and your psychic makeup, how your mind has been, has, has been constructed by the source creator. Now, if you've been doing certain kinds of meditations and uh, breathing exercises and that kind of thing, you could easily increase the capacity for intuitive thoughts to visit you. Muhammad the prophet is said to have been meditating for we don't know how many years up in the cave called the Hira before he received revelation. What is the essence of revelation? Intuitive downloads of information. From where? From the college classroom? No. From the angels, you get it? The angles. Yeah. All angles come down in light form. They are angles of light that come down from the sun. You look at it in the morning. The sun is coming. Its light comes through the tree leaves. And it always, it never comes straight down. It always comes in angles. And mathematics stresses the, important of, the importance of angles. Right angles, right? On and so forth. So you're talking about angels, and you don't even know that the English word angel comes from the English word angle. So they're tricking you with another one, thinking that uh, you're supposed to believe that uh, these little invisible cherub, uh, baby uh, naked butt creatures with wings on their backs are being sent by Allah to take care of earthly affairs and that kind. You don't understand the science of what the Quran has delivered into this world and you're stuck on the fables. There are angels all around you right now. There are angels operating within you as what are called light codes in science. Light codes, C-O-D-E-S. Your nervous system is run based on light. You want me to prove it? Linguistically, the word nerve is from the Quranic Arabic word nur. That's why you talk about neurology when you talk about the nervous system. What is nur? Light. You think they're guessing up this information? They're leaving the masses of people, especially the Muslim community, that has privy to the Quran. They just don't have privy to the correct understanding of the Quran because they've been fed their so-called understanding through the prism of Zoroastrian falsified Arabic meanings for Quranic words. So their understanding is tainted by the fire worshippers of ancient Persia through a religion called Zoroastrianism. What did anybody say again? You created me, meaning you programmed me. Talking to Allah, you programmed me, minar, from fire. You think it's not talking to that instance in history? The Quran is talking to multiple instances throughout history and in current times. But because we don't know the significance of the term nar or fire, we're not getting the point. I'm going to show you one of the major significances before we conclude today. Let me push forward. You know me by now. I don't like to rush my meals. In the word ins, now I want you to concentrate on vowel sounds, open mouthed sounds. A, E, O, A, E, I, O, O. Concentrate on those sounds when you're pronouncing these words again. Inst. I want you to see where the stops are in terms of the consonants. So we have the vowel, the short vowel kesra on the I sound as I. That's it, I. Then you have the noon and the scene following it with no vowels in between. Now, remember, vowels represent the consonant's expression. The consonant cannot express itself as explained in the beginning of today's class. It cannot express itself. It is just the soul of the letter. 
That's it. But you have to add a vowel in order for that masculine entity consonant to become expressed in the world. So there's no expression of the noon, no expression of the letter seen. Let's look at what these letters mean. And boy, if you just get this basic foundational stuff, you, oh, oh, oh you, you, you. <laughs> oh boy, you'll be in the front of the class with this. All right, so. In, 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 that's it, ins, ins. It's like saying, it's, it's the primitive, it's, it's the primitive human. <laughs> you understand? It's the primitive human. He's barely familiar with himself. He, he doesn't even know who he is in history. This one that Allah is describing as ins. He is uh, impetuous. That means he's quick to jump and volunteer and quick to go when he sees fire. <laughs> you remember that human? <laughs> you go out and you light a match and ooh, 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 like you know, Herman Munster. Yeah. Ooh, 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 ooh. Lily, Lily. <laughs> Just because a match was struck. Primitive, because he doesn't know the ins and outs and the intricacies of nature. He is under the blackness of nature. That's the original black man that Elijah Muhammad and his teacher, W.D. Farad, were discussing. The original black. He wasn't talking about no skin color. He was talking about the mind. Man means mind. And the original mind, in all cases, for all people, throughout all time, Every people were first born out of the blackness of nature and the fear of nature, the lightning bolt, the thunder clap, the shark fins jumping up out of the water. Whoa, what is that? The creatures in the jungle with the sharp teeth. Nobody knew how to catch those creatures way back when. We were afraid of nature. That's ins. Now let's look at it. Noon represents the intuition in the human realm of thinking. The intuition. It depends on downloads from nature to educate it. Intuitive thoughts. They don't all have to be correct. The baby is born with intuitive spark, but it's mostly incorrect the way they view things intuitively. They are depending on intuition because they don't have knowledge yet. They don't have a developed intellect yet. Their intellect is being newly introduced to ideas through the activation of their newly born five senses when they come out of the womb. There were no five senses active on the most part while they were in gestation within their mother's. It was after they came out and they began to open their eyes and see and open their ears and hear more and open their mouths and taste, reach out for mama and touch, open up their noses and smell the difference between their mother's breasts and, you know, their father's hairy chest. So their five senses had to first be activated in the world before the intellect could begin to develop. In lieu of that development, which represents their protection, they needed to rely on what they had innately within them, and that was intuition. Until they could grow enough intellectually to where they didn't have to depend as much on intuition on that elementary fundamental level anymore. They could now depend on the knowledge base that they had gathered from study, 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 and the development of the intellect, the internal electing of ideas to come into the mind and help develop the mind and build the world. This is amazing information. So that's ints. So if the N is not expressing itself, neither is the 
S sound expressing itself in S. It means that the intuition was dormant or weak at best. And whatever the letter seen represents was also dormant. And the letter seen, as most of you who have been studying mimetics now, you know that the letter seen has to do with the intellect itself. The chewing of the intellect. Seen in Arabic represents the cleaning of the teeth. The sanitizing. See? Seen. Sana. Sanitizing. Sana has to do with the cleanliness of the teeth when you take some miswack or some brush or something and you get rid of the particles and that kind of thing and, uh, you know, you make the mouth nice and fresh. Sanitized. Get it? Yeah, well, that's what the letter seen means. It represents the chewing that's necessary for that cleaning to take place. You chew on the tree bark. They call it miswack in Arabic. Right? And it cleans the teeth. So what else in the human makeup chews? The intellect chews, but it chews on information. You put information into the brain and it goes to work to begin to separate it into pieces, manageable pieces. That's what the intellect is designed to do. Let me take this. This is too heavy for me right now, what Instructor Bilal is saying, but he said something 10 minutes ago that I got on my notebook. Well, I'm going to study that. I think I can handle that. See, your intellect is doing that. It's chewing. It's separating pieces. It's taking big chunks of stuff like I'm doing today, and it's whittling it down into small, more manageable pieces for you to digest. It needs to be assimilated into your system so your body can use it for fuel, hmm? energy. That's what learning is. It's supposed to be an energy exchange. You give your education energy, by attending the class, by doing the work, putting in the work, doing some homework, talking to people, expanding your horizons in terms of that subject, asking other people what they think about it or whatever. That's an exchange. Now you're giving them something and now the environment is going to give you something. The more you do that, the smarter, the wiser, the more fit, mentally fit, morally, emotionally and spiritually fit you're going to become because you're you're involved in a chewing process when it comes to information. You're not just swallowing things whole like you used to do when you were a child. There is the Santa Claus. So you swallowed that whole when you were seven years old. My mother said there's a Santa. Yeah. There is a white God, son of God called Jesus. You swallowed that when you were a little child also. It's just that you never grew out of it. Humans can be God. You never grew out of it. In the nation of Islam, they haven't grown out of it. Humans can be God. In lieu of God, the one who created them and gave them his Ar-Rahman, mercy, with all of the benefits he's bestowed upon them. 70 years later, some of them still can't see that man is not God. <laughs> you live, you eat, you poop, you pee, and you die. And some work in between there. You do some work in between there that will hopefully get you some brownie points in your innocence. But if you divorce yourself from that level of association, shirk, divorce yourself from it, man, with the intellect that people in the nation of Islam are known for, you would be on top of the hill in no time. Just got to stop being scared to defy authority when it's necessary to defy authority that itself knows it's off course in terms of its logic in today's time. Elijah Muhammad and Farah, they get a pass from me. But after W.D. Muhammad being in this world for 33 straight years of teaching, nobody else who's teaching that gets a pass from me. You, you name it, if they're about seven different iterations of the nation of Islam. You might not know that. There are about seven groups on this earth right now calling themselves the nation of Islam in some form or another. And they're still teaching the old teachings of Elijah Muhammad and the black man is God and the white man is the devil. You don't get any more passes from me. Not that that means anything to you. You don't even know me. I'm just mm -hmm. telling you, I'm putting it on record for the future 
that people who you shouldn't give those people any more passes. Praise be to Allah. That's a fact. Thank you. Just like you shouldn't give these church people any more passes and you know, them trying to promote the white Jesus or any Jesus as being the biological son of God. There's too much knowledge in the world now. You should be the ones as Christians, quote unquote, to involve yourself in the correction of these concepts. Don't you know God would be more pleased with you if you would correct something that led more to the purity of a uh, of, of service that people could give to the creator without all of these fables being in the way? If you knew what Jesus was for you in you, you'd understand me better. If you knew what Moses was for you in you, you'd understand. Muslims, if you knew what Muhammad was, not who, if you knew what Muhammad was, for you, operating in you, you'd be more successful as a Muslim. Praise be to Allah. Understand what I'm saying. You think the Muhammad that the Quran is speaking about is a person from 1400 years ago? Not according to the way Allah pronounces his name in the Quran. He pronounces it Muhammadun and Muhammadan. That's generic. That little A-N sound and that U-N sound, Muhammadun, that's generic. If I want to tell you what a generic book is, I call it Kitabun. If I want to know what it is specifically, I say Al-Kitab, the book. But if I just want, if I'm talking about any book that fits that description, I say Kitabun. So if I say, or if Allah in this case says Muhammadun, he's talking about any Muhammad that fits that description, not one individual person. That would have been Al-Muhammad. Not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but you didn't create this mess. So don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> if you knew who created it and why they're keeping it in existence, you would be pissed, excuse the expression, because they are right around you. Leaders that you see on YouTube every day, they were all shaked down and bearded up. <laughs> they know better, <laughs> but they're teaching you that okie doke because it makes plenty of moolah for them. They're not going to give up their palaces by telling you the truth. You have to figure the truth out for yourself and be brave enough to break the, the chain that they're using to corral you like some animal at the masjid. Keeping you blind, deaf, and dumb, and stupid to what Al-Islam and Al-Quran are actually and factually presenting to you. Amazing. All right, here we go. And uh, we're not going to go beyond the 10 o'clock mark tonight. We have about a good 30 minutes or so left, inshallah. And it's important to take this kind of time. We're in a classroom. Keep that in mind. This is not a public discussion. This is not a public lecture in an auditorium somewhere. This is not a world stage where I'm trying to satisfy everybody's intellects who have joined us from around the planet. This is not what this is. We have some international students, but they are just as national and just as informed and in tune with what I'm saying as those of you who are right in the next state are. There's no division of states and countries for nunetics. So everybody in here is in the classroom, no matter where they're from, and nobody else at this point is being invited until the instructor says it's okay for you to invite them. Keep that in mind. From this day forward, don't invite the public to what I have to say. What I have to say is going to be too overwhelming, too overpowering, and too e emotional for some people to handle because I'm, I'm, I'm breaking up myths that they have been living with since they were born, if they were born so-called Muslims. I'm dealing death blows from this point on to mythologies that are crippling us, crippling our minds and our spirits and our ability to live the true community life instead of this fake, phony, fraudulent thing that they're calling the ummah of Muslims in the world. Fake, phony, fraudulent. The day you'll know when they're not faking and frauding you anymore is when they say, 
I want to announce today that there, if for me and my congregation, there's no such thing anymore as, as Sunni and Shia and all of that. When they start saying we're just Muslims, that's it. We're Muhammad, the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, told us that we were Muslims. He never introduced any Sunni Muslim or any Shia Muslim or any Ahmadi Muslim or any uh, you know uh, whatever the four schools and all. Muhammad the Prophet didn't know anything about any four schools of thought for Muslims. They got the idea of schools of thought from the Catholic Church and from Judaism, which itself is divided into four or five basic schools. Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, Reformed Jew. What is a, a Reformed Jew? What are all the rest of them? Criminals? You don't understand the quagmire that you've been dragged into without even knowing it. So follow sense. I'm really not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but I'm not going to preserve your feelings at the expense of you remaining stupid. Time's out for that. No more of that. Let's continue. This is a good meal. It's no vowel over the N, no vowel over the S, which means that whatever those two letters mean, they are dormant as far as this word is concerned. So that's the intuition, nun, and the intellect, seen. There's no real expression. This is how all humans begin, no matter where their particular tribe or social group were in their development, no matter where they were on the planet, in their beginning stages. They did not have an activated intu intuition. They didn't need it. They didn't need it. Just like a baby born into a household doesn't need to have all of this super duper intuition to stave off danger. There shouldn't be any danger in a household. Everybody loves this kid. Excuse the expression. I don't like to call children kids. But everybody loves this little goat. Ain't nobody trying to hurt him. He realizes right away that everybody's showing love. So his intuition that is supposed to regulate whether danger is in the environment or not, that's the way it's going to turn way down. It's turned way down. And the intellect, well, there's not a whole lot that he needs to think about, so the intellect is turned down also. That's ints. Now let's move to the next one. Nice. Now listen carefully. Remember that the vowel indicates the expression of what that word, of what that letter means. So, nice. Now you have the noon, the intuition, that's given a vowel sound. Nah. See? Nah. So that means intuition is activated. So when it comes to whatever Allah is calling Nas in the Quran, it means that these are people with a very developed sense of intuition. Why? Because Nas are the ones who are charged with leaving that small tribal environment and creating a more sophisticated environment that involves socialization, meeting new people. Allah tells you this in the Quran. He says that I created you as nations and tribes, that you might become familiar with each other. That you might get to know each other. And he uses the term, and nas, I created you, and nas. I created you as these smaller groups so that you might venture out of those smaller, con uh, contain uh, smaller containers and begin to learn the world. Learn how to respect other people and their cultures and their customs and their foods and their dresses and their dances and all of these things. You got to go out and, and search that out and, and, and learn the ups and downs, the vicissitudes of those relationships and how to handle them so that you can grow in your soul to become more evolutionary in your thinking. That's what a Nazis mission to do. Not stay at home with the, the, with the, with the mommy. And with no challenges in its environment, no, get out of the crib, get out of the bed and get on out there and go to school. That's when you become nice. When the intuition, who should I sit next to in this class? You look at that guy's face, he looks like he's a troublemaker. You don't want to sit there. See, that's a nice operating in you. The intuition is alive. It's, it's working. 
But what's not working? The dormant letter S or scene, the intellect. Nas. No vowel given to the scene, to the S. The N, it's been activated. The intuition, activated. The seed has been planted. And if it's in the correct environment, it's going to begin to breathe beneath the soil and then eventually above the soil. And it's going to give you some produce just from you using the fitra in the way that it was designed to be used and the way that it was programmed. <laughs> Respect the program, get the result. Disrespect the program, die and be replaced. That's the fitra. That's cruel. That's the fit law. All right. Nas. Activated intuition. Dormant intellect. Now the next stage is the one we've been discussing. Insan. Now listen to where the vowels fall. You have insan. Now the noon is made dormant. In. It's not giving any expression, no vowel. What's given the vowel this time is the sin, in san. Hmm. So the intuition has been dampened down. Why? Because the intellect of people who have been traveling and motivated to meet other people and get to know other people and share and share alike with other people. You don't have to be as on guard intuitively with the people that you are getting to know like that. You don't have to be on guard. That's what knowledge will do for you. It'll civilize you. It'll take the sword out of your hand so you won't be as apt to just start swinging on everybody who's new in the neighborhood. You'll still be careful, but you don't have to be vigilant on that level. So it's in sign. Now the intellect is expressing itself in sign, and then it falls on another silent noon. And the only way that last noon, which is not a part of the other words, but you know, noon means the intuition. The only way it is able to express itself is if it is followed by another word. If that's the last word in the sentence, then you don't give it a vowel. You don't say insana. You say insan. See? Here, it's given a vowel on the noon because it's followed by more words. So then you would say, Khalakal insana min alak. But if there was nothing after insan, you would just say, Khalakal insan. That's it. Created the human being. Zip the lip. So if you know that the noon is representative of intuition, there must be a secondary intuition operating in you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> It's the intuition that Instructor Bilal has been slowly sprinkling on you over the past couple of years called the supra, I call it that, supra intuition. Write that down. S-U-P-R-A dash intuition. I-N-T-U-I-T-I-V. No, T-I-O-N, sorry. Intuition, yeah. Supra, meaning above and beyond. <laughs> intuition. See, the first intuition was baby intuition. It's the intuition that Allah gives every newborn child to be able to defend itself against possible danger. The way something sounds, the way something or somebody looks at it. Nah, you didn't even do nothing, but you know, <laughs> that baby didn't, didn't think you're that beautiful. They think you look a little bit scary. So, ah, you know, it's happened to all of us. <laughs> And you say to yourself, I didn't, even, I didn't even do anything. But there's something about your vibration, something about your frequency that is disharmonious with the child's budding, newly introduced frequency into the world. They're just like two weeks old. They don't know. Don't feel bad. Don't feel offended. They don't mean any harm. They don't mean any offense. That's just the way their fit to our frequencies are operating on that level. How wonderful this is. So in the first intuition, that baby intuition, 
turned turned all the way down now in favor of what the intellect's evolution inside and the, that evolution of the intellect is supposed to link up with the higher level of intuition that I'm calling supra intuition supra intuition becomes activated by something in the body called the pineal gland it's sitting squarely in the center of the brain a little pea-sized organ buried actually buried you hear these stories in uh, scripture about the burial of this character and uh, the other character, the burial of Christ and all, you know, in the, in the crypt and all. You don't understand what those things in scripture mean. It's talking about things that are buried within you, within your psychic makeup, within your emotionality, within your intellect's climb of the ladder of Jacob, Jacob's ladder. That's your DNA doing that. So the purpose is to situate yourself so that your supra-intuitive pineal gland energies can also be activated. That's what will give it that final vowel sound. Insana min alak. Insana. That's the activation of that pineal gland slash organ in you. And there are certain ways to activate it that we're not going to discuss tonight. Most of it you won't be able to handle in the serving necessary for your understanding. So that's what next semester is for. If I have to spoon feed it to you, that's why I'm going to be breaking up this whole group into two or three people at a time during the week or on certain weekdays during the day. I'll invite two or three of you at a time, four maybe, max. And we're going to be going over a back and forth where you can answer me back and ask me questions, two and back, back and forth, back and forth, until I know that I have you on my pages, they understand. If you choose to do that, I'm giving you the opportunity. If you don't choose and you just want to remain in the shadow, that's fine. Also, that's even you paid for it. That's your business. For those of you who know what this is, and I believe it's the majority of you, maybe over 95% of you, you know what this is, and I believe you're going to participate. Whole, I think you've been waiting and praying for this kind of day when the instructor would make himself available. And I can do it without burning the candle at both ends. I'm learning out of that. That's why I got help coming. I got troops coming. Instructors who have been with us, executives, senior instructors, and all of the senior stuff, they're ready. They're ready to teach you. I'm going to show them, continue showing them how to teach you. Then I don't have to do it all myself. And I think that's mercy and it makes sense. And I think most of you are applauding right now. Instructor, you're making the right decision. Don't burn yourself out when somebody else can teach me three letters at a time. Yeah, yeah. And we got 19, we got 20 books coming as of uh, this 23rd of this month. I will have 20 books on the website. And if you can't get it from that, you can't get it or you don't want it. Whichever way it goes, let's continue. I won't slap any more hands tonight, I promise. Now, ints, dormant intuition, dormant intellect. Nas, activated Intuition, dormant, intellect. Insan, dormant, initial intuition, that baby intuition. Activated, intellect, seen. That has the possibility for evolving into an expressed level of supra intuition. That's the last known in sana. It has that possibility. It actually goes back and forth. It can go to in san and, and not express that pineal potential, or it can go to in sana if you're in the right environment with the right prompts and triggers to produce that level of understanding that will tap you into what instructor Bilal? It will tap you into cosmic connections for knowledge. 
that go way beyond your university of whatever you've been attending and getting degrees from. May Allah bless those people for teaching you. But when you tap into the cosmos, you will be delivering information on the level that you see this guy right here. This guy right here, he's tapped in. And I don't have to prove it to you. I think I already have. I think you would be able to tell me. It's an instructor. And you, I think you're there. Many of you have told me that. Yeah, I know your source. People ask me all of the time. <laughs> Our brother Sean, he was here a couple of weeks ago. He said, instructor, I just want to know, where do you get it? Because he knows it's beyond normal. The, the, the scholars that I speak to, Dr. Omar, he knows what I have is beyond his grasp. Not his grasp in terms of him not being able to learn it. His grasp in, turn of, in terms of him learning this from some source of uh, academic uh, something out there. The woman, the, the president of the Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies Department at Duke University in uh, here in North Carolina, in Durham, North Carolina. She understood it the first time she saw my book, Nunetics. She said, where did you get? She said, I have seen scholars with meanings for some letters. She said, I have never met anybody. And she's not the first one to tell me that as a scholar of Arabic. I had another brother tell me that through a good learner, friend of ours, Ibn Suleiman, a friend of his that he, who was a master of Arabic, he told me the same thing. He said, I have some people who know meanings for some letters. He said, but I've never met anybody who has meanings for every single letter in the Arabic letter system. And believe me, the meanings that they have are nowhere near matching what Nunetics is bringing you as understanding of letters. This is just a gift to just chalk it uh -huh. up. What are you doing? I'm listening to this. What are yeah. you doing? Chalk it up. Miss Arlene, your phone is open. It is too yeah. loud. <laughs> yeah. Miss Arlene, your, 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 your phone is being too loud because we're hearing everything you're saying. Could you kindly, uh, let me see if I can do it from here. Hold on. Sometimes people's phones get unmuted and they don't realize it. But that's beautiful. She has that little child listening. <laughs> I'll try not to be too loud. <laughs> Remember you know, Muhammad's little son asked him one time, said, Daddy, why you talk so loud? <laughs> he said, he went up to him in his ear and he said, because I want the people to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Arlene. That's, that's a beautiful thing here at, the, at almost 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. She has her grandchild, I'm guessing, listening to Nunetics. That's how we're going to make progress. Believe you me, that's the key to making show enough progress. All right, so here we go. Going to get you out of here by 10 p.m. with the help of Allah. So you understand what insan is. And I'm going to be teaching techniques for properly activating that pineal gland energy, not as a Eastern guru. God bless them for what they do. But they do some very dangerous stuff trying to get that pineal to open up and take you where? What have those people done for the world? I'm not trying to bring anybody into that cage where you take a chance on, on, on committing mental suicide, just trying to open up a little pea-sized... No, why would Allah make it that difficult? I always ask myself that question. Why would he put you in danger, physical harm's way, through some technique that is designed to open up the pineal gland? No. Leave minds all... I don't, matter of fact, I don't really preach pineal gland activation as they're discussing it. I don't think the pineal gland is supposed to be activated. Not on the level that they're talking about. I think it can be stimulated and used. I think the utility in it is available to anybody who puts in the practice and who slows down their role enough to understand the true purpose of meditation, contemplation, dhikr, repetitive thinking, or remembering, but remembering specifics, not just anything, not just any kind of reminder or remembering. No, dhikr, hmm. I dare say this, cover the little child's ears for a second. Dhikr is related to the English word dick, D-I-C-K. 
Think about Dick Tracy. That's the Dick, the detective. He was a detective. And the nasty people in the world, they understood that that part of the male's body is a detective also. It's it's detecting. <laughs> See? And what it does is that it specifies a particular opening and direction for what it is emitting into the female or the feminine principle. It's very specific. It's very calculated. It's not sending many things. It's sending one thing in multiples. All of the sperm look like all of the other sperm. And its objective looks like one thing, the ovum. She doesn't have two or three different things that it's aiming for. See, oneness, Allah has created this concept of oneness to permeate this creation. There's a lot of different things, but all of them amount to one thing. If you were to put all of creation in a cauldron and boil it down to its essence, it's going to be energy at the bottom of the pot because everything is composed of energy. And energy can neither be created nor destroyed, not by you, <laughs> by Allah for sure, but not for, by humans. You can't. That's why did Allah says, do not speak of my servants as being dead. <laughs> they are alive, but not in your perception. You don't know how to look at it because you don't have the right eye. You need the eye of the pineal looking at creation. And that's when you'll say, oh, no, they're not dead. The energy is still here. There are still people doing work, whether you believe it or not. And this might sound a little spooky, but there are still people who you consider to be dead, who are very much alive and still doing good work on this earth right now as we speak including some of your relatives. Now, I'm not talking about spooky thing, you know, somebody looking over you as a guardian angel, your cousin Pookie died and he's coming back to help you and help you make money. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about energy and frequency. Big subject. Can't cover it in a few minutes. But energy never dies. As Imam Muhammad said, when you die, that energy is released. Oh, man. And he said, and when it's released, that's when it is able to do its best work. This body is a corporeal container of energy. And you can only exercise and, and, and promote but so much of this energy in your helping other people. You got to eat, you got to sleep, and you got to worry, you become depressed. That's all built into this biology. But absent the biology, your soul is free to assist the universe. Sound spooky? Good. Believe in that kind of spook. That's the real spook right there. All right. Lastly, Now, here's a beautiful word in the Quran. They don't give this word enough credit. Alak. Min means from or of. Sometimes they translate it. And there are better translations even than that. We're not going to go through that tonight. So he programmed Al Insan with all that I told you Al Insan represents from or it is of an alak. Alak. Alakin. So what is an alak? This is ein, lam, kof. Again, ein, lam, kof. Pronounce it to yourself. Alak. And let it go to the back of the throat, that Q sound. Alak. Alak. All right. So that's what they're translating as congealed, meaning brought together in a gel form. You hear the word jail in English? Compare it to the English word gel. Jail brings like things together. 
they're called criminals and uh, law officials, you know, law officers, sheriff or whoever, anybody else maintaining the jail. It brings all of those people together and they have to jail. And to congeal, con means with jail or gel, gelling factor, congealed blood. Blood, that is what they call coagulated. If your blood is experiencing the opposite of coagulation, you could uh, cut yourself shaving and bleed to death. If you are taking anticoagulants, you got to be real careful about what you do, nicking your finger, cutting your face with a razor, or falling on something sharp. Man, you had better be sharp enough to call your doctor or the hospital or the ambulance quick if you started bleeding as a person who is on anticoagulants because the blood was created by the fitra in the fitra to group itself together for its own protection, for a better facilitation of its flow through the body. If an aperture is created and that flow becomes interrupted, then if too much blood escapes the body, then the body becomes what, what's called dumb, D-U-M-B. Dumb means mute. And mute is related to the Arabic word mate, which means a dead. Maitun, dead, muted. The body becomes muted out, either silenced. That's what dumb means, to be silent. Doesn't mean to be stupid. When you're playing dumb, you're just being, you're pretending like you don't know and you can't say and all of that. Where were you on the night of? I was home, I guess. <laughs> Somebody in court playing dumb, right? So it doesn't mean stupid. It's from the Arabic word dam, and dam means blood in Arabic. It's in Adam's name, Adam, 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 dam. The A is the A of negation, which means not. So Adam means not dumb. So if that's the father of humanity, then Allah created your first type, your first species to not be dumb. Why are you dumb? Why am I dumb? It, that can't be my father. I can't be Banu Adama. I can't be the child of, of that one, of the one who's not dumb, if I'm acting dumb. And I can only act dumb because Allah gave me the potential to be this mighty force in the world, contributing an intellect that can help humanity evolve into the future upon greater possibilities than the possibilities and opportunities that are presently in front of us. Every single one of us can contribute to that without a college degree. You got to go inside for that. You got to go introspective to bring that out of you. That's what education means. It means to bring out something that was dormant or latent within you. To educe means to lead out, not to put in. Education is not the process of putting information in. Education, in its true sense, is the process of pulling information or awakening potential that is able to express itself outside of you. You want to know a truly educated person? Look at his environment. Look at the people that they're married to. Look at the neighborhood they choose to live in. Look at the friends, the socialization that they participate in. Look at the things they watch on television and, and entertain themselves by. That's how you'll know a truly educated person. They're not going to be dealing with death cult information. You know, their whole life is sports and entertainment. That's death culture. Not that you can't be out there on the basketball court or the football field. No, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about when you give 90% of your attention, remember what you give your attention to expands. When you give 90% of your attention to stuff that does not bring you any value or increase, then you're just participating in a ritual. See the RT in ritual? It's going somewhere, but it's off the cliff. It's not bringing you any returns. Ritual, for ritual's sake. It's not a routine. A routine is going to benefit you. Oh, you're going to be learning all about that in this new book on Salat, The True Meaning of the Salat, Volume 2. It's due December 23rd. You're, you can put in your order now. 
<laughs> oh, you're going to learn the difference between a ritual that they call ritual prayer that has been misnamed so that you learn the difference between that and a routine, R-O-U-T-I-N-E. A routine is a route, which means you're headed somewhere. You see the R and T? Same as the R and D. It's a road that's leading you somewhere. But some roads, if you're not paying attention to the signs that say dead end, you can be off of the cliff if you're not paying attention. Other roads, if you learn to read the signs accurately, will take you to your destination. How beautiful it is. All right, winding down. Blood is a symbol, as I said, of the social life, the gathering of people, the coagulating, if you will, the gelling of people and types that complement each other. Allah is saying that he created al insana out of this cooperative mentality amongst people who want to socialize and share their resources like the blood does throughout the body. It shares its nutrients throughout the body. That's your true human nature, the true human in you. No matter who it is, the stranger next door, you see the child is having a problem tying his shoes. You, you help him. Just do it in front of his mother. Don't do it if it's just you and the child. It's too dangerous for that now. They'll accuse you of all kinds of stuff. Go to your child's school. Volunteer. That's what I'm talking about. That's the coagulation, the social bonding that human nature is uh, retrofitted for. Help the people who need help. That's what your human socialization is for because that is what is giving increase to the soul and providing the shell for the soul that we call soul shell. Being soul shell, providing protection for all persons involved beginning with your household. All right. And the blood represents the social life. So this is saying that we have been programmed as an insan, the social being, coupled with the thinking being. We have been programmed men from or out of or as a reflection of. Where do you get that instructor? I never saw that in the dictionary for men. Well, compare it to the other words that have the MN connection. Moon. What is the moon? The moon is a reflector. It reflects the light of the greater light called the sun. It doesn't come with everything that the sun has to offer as light. It's some of it. That's what min means. From, it doesn't mean that it's the only thing that Allah created al insan from. Min means that he created us from some of the alaq. And he created us from other things that you have to discover as you continue to read. My goodness gracious, right? So, and he didn't create us from a clot. A clot is a danger sign in the blood. You should know that now with all of this COVID information out here. A clot in the blood is, a, is an emergency situation. So no, Allah did not create the human being from an emergency situation. I don't know if they did that on purpose. I hope not. The translators. It has nothing to do with a clot. It has to do with a coagulation, a coming together of substances to form a protection and an advancement of the nutrition, the nutrients that are in the blood to make sure that they make it to their route properly, safely, mm? that they make their rounds throughout the body from the brain and all of its need for blood, all of the way down to your tippy tippy toes. The blood is circulating, circulating throughout the body. With the distribution that is just, your, your, your little toe doesn't need what your heart needs or what your brain or lungs or spleen or intestines need as blood. Little toe doesn't need that. You make a mistake and chop that toe off on the job and you can go on. You might be 
hopping a little bit. But you can live without that little toe, without the big toe, without the foot. But don't have anybody just pulling the intestines out of your body or snatching the heart out of the body or snatching the lungs and the kidneys out of the body. Don't have them do that. That's called the justice. All right. So blood is the social life. So what is the social life essentially? You could do a term paper on this. You could write a small booklet on this. Blood representing the social life means that the social life is a combination of the social inclinations in humans to want to group together. They call it the gregarious nature. You have to congregate gregarious. You're, you're naturally interested in congregating. And the worst punishment is isolation. The worst punishment, if you're in prison and you continue to, to act a fool, they put you in what's called solitary confinement. See, solitary. So they're isolating the soul from other souls until the soul becomes deadened. The soul, I think one of our writers wrote a book called Soul on Ice. See? That's when the soul becomes deadened. And we call it isolation, to isolate. Ice, I-C-E, the way you're hearing it. Soul, the soul becomes ice until it becomes late. Late means dead. The late so-and-so, just, he just passed away three months ago. He's late. <laughs> And they don't mean late like he didn't show up on time. <laughs> they mean late because late is short for lateral. Lateral means horizontal. That's how he's laid out or she's laid out now. So they are lateral. So the soul becomes ice or frozen until it becomes lateral. And when you become lateral, you're no longer of benefit to people who were designed and programmed to operate vertically upright posture. So you are no good to people who claim to be upright on the sirat al-mustaqim, the upward path. You're no good to them anymore because you're, you, you, for all intents and purposes, you're like Lazarus. Dead. At least from the neck up in need of a checkup, as our young people like to say. <laughs> so with that said, I think that's enough. We've had a wonderful time. We've had some really great information passed through the portal in the last couple of hours, inshallah. And uh, I'm very happy. Yes, latent is another word. The soul is latent or at rest. It doesn't mean there's nothing there that can be activated. It means that it is not experiencing activation. All right. It's a beautiful day. I, I, I thank you people who contribute these nice pieces of information. It lets me know that you are truly understanding the direction of this Nunetics method and the importance of using it. And that's what next semester is going to be all about. Now, I gave you a challenge in closing in the email for those who got the email that if you're going to join us if you're not a member of the University Online Learning Course and you're going to join us, you need to pay your uh, tuition for semester 24, which begins on January 1st. But good news, anybody, that means those who are already members, as well as anyone who is new who wants to join us, the cost is normally $300 per month which I am reducing for semester number 24 to only $200 for That's what, this for this next semester. Pardon for me? The whole, not per month, but for the whole semester. Oh, I'm sorry. For the whole semester, which is three months. Thank you for that correction. I know I, I could hear some people gasping, losing air, about to faint. <laughs> Worry not. Thank you. See, that's why we got this man on the other end. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, yeah, it's $300, uh, $300 normally every three months. Yeah. And uh, so we're entering into the last of the three months for semester number 24. 
we're in 24 now, right? We. I'm not sure, but uh, according yeah. to, uh, according to the uh, invitation when you sent it out, uh, we're in 24 now, entering 25. Yes, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay, yeah. So in January we'll be in semester 25. That's my number two and five seven. Or oh, I, I, wonderful things happen for me when I'm under that seven vibration. Uh, born in July on the 16th of day, you know what's about to happen. All right. Um, so if you pay between now and December 23rd, the day that the new book comes out, anybody just joining us or have been with us, it doesn't matter. Your payment will only be $200, not $300. If you pay between right now when we hang up and December 23rd, if you pay after the 23rd, then that payment is going to be the regular $300 charge. I hope that's understandable to everybody. I'll put it in another email so folks can understand it. Okay. So that's a little grace period that will save you $100 off the bat. In fact, I'm going to do something even extra as the spirit moves me to do. Anybody who pays that payment for semester number 25 between tonight and December 23rd will also receive a free new book, The True Meaning of the Select Volume 2, which is a $40 prize. You get it for free. Now, if you pay after December 23rd, the 24th on, that book is going to cost you. Same book is going to cost you $40. So it depends on whether you have it or not, whether you got it like that or not, or whatever your situation is. But some of you have that advantage where you're able to, to uh, manipulate your funds for that purpose. And I want you to be totally uh, aware of the value of what you're receiving. If I could do this and charge nothing, and I see a point in the near future when I'll be able to just invite people in and not charge them anything. I know that day is coming. Allah is preparing a wonderful table of goodies and blessings for us. And your only work at that point will be to invite other people. Come on, man. How, how much is it? It's free. <laughs> oh, isn't that a wonderful day? That's what they call a hallelujah day, you know, in the church. That's what we're waiting for. But it ain't like that right now. So please assist this Nunetics Institute effort to establish this language and logic that we call the Nunetics Method. You know how valuable it is. You want to convince anybody, once you get this replay, just give them the link. I think today will convince them that this is worth their while. Oh, my goodness. And somebody just paid. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Alhamdulillah. For all of you. I love all of you, truly. You're very near and dear to my heart and to Karima's heart and to the hearts of other Nunetics learners and instructors. Thank you for being the gracious people that you are. And I'm happy that Allah chose you for me and that he chose me for you. We got a lot of work ahead to do. This is part one of this Meaning for the word ikra as reading, we're going to be talking about the other ikra that follows that ikra. If you're not familiar with it, visit Surah 96 and read the first five verses. That's your homework. It mentions ikra or reading twice within those five verses. So two out of the three verses mention ikra and they translate it as read or recite but Instructor Benjamin Bilal is going to be giving you a much deeper and much more significant meaning for both of those readings as you find them operating in the fitra. And that includes the fitra of your own self. Those yeah. readings are in you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So with that said, I think I've said enough. And whatever I didn't get a chance to say, we'll put it in an email. If I don't have your email address, please email it to me uh, at cosmicquran1 at gmail.com. I'm going to spell it out for you, and it'll be included at the end of the video if you receive that. But you won't receive it if I don't know what email to send it to. So make sure that you write this down. C-O-S-M-I-C-Q-U. 
U R A N one, the number one at gmail.com. One more once. C O S M I C Q U R. Not messing with you. A N Cosmic Quran one, the number one at gmail.com. Just email me. And uh, inshallah, this is going to be processed for rumble.com, not for YouTube. You will not see this. You will not get a notice or a link for this replay on YouTube. You're going to get a notice. Those of you who are on my email list, you'll get a notice. But it's going to send you to a link for rumble.com. And we have to build our numbers almost from the beginning on rumble.com. Dot com. That's our challenge. I hope everyone is hearing us, William. Rumble.com. And we will also be broadcasting from Kajabi, from a new platform that's going to be able to service Rumble. Thank you, William. It's going to be able to service uh, Rumble along with about five other platforms, Patreon, and we're going to be all over the place in a minute our numbers are going to exponentially increase over this next semester, 25. You want to be along for that journey. There are going to be so many people that I have to take you individually and in small groups, like I mentioned, to make sure that those of you who have been here before the crowds come, either when comes the help of Allah, that day is coming for us. And the day Allah says, you see the people entering the deen of Allah in crowds. That happens over and over again in history. It's going to happen for Nunetics Institute. Because we're following the same Fitra-based formula. All right? So, be well. Oh, okay. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, he put the channel there. And uh, Patricia's going to send that to me, and I'll include that in the replay. Thank you so much. Oh, we got some help. Well, Jamal, the help. When comes the help? No. You better recognize that we already have the help. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we got some powerful people on board right now. Oh, I'm telling you, I can't wait. That's why I can't sleep. That's why I go to sleep at three and four in the morning almost every night. But it's well worth the effort. Thank you all. As I greet you in the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. Salamun alaikum to you all and to well, your families. Well, alaikum as-salam.